You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Zaza Osmanov. Dr. Zaza Osmanov is a professor at the School of Physics, Free University of Tbilisi. His areas of research are physics, astrophysics, and SETI, specifically the search for techno signatures. His most recent papers looked at the capabilities of China's fast radio telescope to search the galaxy and other galaxies for von Neumann probes, as well as why we should study pulsars to search for alien megastructures. Remember to subscribe to Event Horizon so you never miss an episode. Dr. Zaza Osmanov, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, Doctor, you work in astrobiology, among other fields. And within astrobiology, years ago, decades ago, the mathematician, very famous mathematician, John von Neumann, came up with the idea of self-replicating probes, essentially mimicking how life itself, you know, microbial life itself reproduces and self-reproduces. And the idea was that it could be done technologically. Now, in the case of the von Neumann probe, we have the very special possibility that with such a shelf replicator, they could be in every star system in the galaxy at sub-relativistic speeds in short order. Over a few million years, you could populate the entire galaxy with such probes. If that is the case, how do we begin looking for them just in case there might be one in this star system? Well, there are several parts we have to understand. Uh, first is, uh, if we are talking about standard von Neumann probes, which von Neumann has, was uh, talking about, I'm actually not talking about this particular you know, kind of von Neumann probes, but some kind of, in my paper, I actually extended the idea of von Neumann. I propose that if ETs exist, okay, if they are technologically advanced enough, then, you know, the major question is, what is the most rapid case for colonizing the, you know, some, spe- some certain part of Milky Way or space? As it turned out, the best way is to use uh, not just, you know, standard big length scale probes, but microprobes. It turned out that actually if microprobes, very small length scale probes exist, of course, and in any case, I have to say that if they exist, because we don't know, we have no data about uh, about ETs, if they exist, but we have, to, we have to say always that if they exist, if they have enough technology, uh, level of technology, then the best way is to is to colonize the universe for by, by, by using microprobes, because the time scale of colonizing is very short in case of small scale, small length scale self replicators. But it depends on you know on several f- factors. In my calculations, actually, I I've shown that depending on uh, on parameters, on particular parameters of of nebulae, for example, of a particular place in uh, in in Milky Way. Let's uh, let's talk about Milky Way because it's not very it's it's quite typical for us. And in in Milky Way, we can find a lot of different kinds of nebula or some diffusive hydrogen nebula case, uh, you, you know, uh, stuff. And depending on that, uh, depending on substance, depending on density, temperature, on, on many parameters, these very small scale self replicators, they will be different depending on, on these parameters. For example, I've shown that if the extraterrestrial intelligence has to colonize typical you know, one astronomical unit length scale nebula, the scale of the probe has to be approximately about micrometer, which is very small, of course. And compared to what von Neumann was talking about, it's much, much small, <laughs> smaller. Yeah. With this, the size, this almost nanotechnological size of these self-replicators, that would make self-replication more efficient, wouldn't it? Yeah, 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 exactly. It's a uh, it becomes more efficient. I mean, more more efficient in the sense of time scale of, of colonizing the you know uh, the nebula or or whatever. Can they function? You know, if you look at, at classical views of nanotechnology, at least projecting them into the future, could they work in you know a concerted effort? In other words, could the von Neumann probe look more like a cloud than an actual singular object? So, in other words, would you send? say for your task of exploration of a star system, would you send a whole bunch of them to self-replicate and create a big cloud of them to do the work and sort of 
spread it out, or would you just simply need one tiny little machine? Oh, okay. In my calculations, what I what I've done is uh, the initial. I took just you know very very na- natural number of uh, of initial number of self replicators, replicators about hundred, let's say, and finally the number of replicators at the end of of, of a of col- col- colonizing. I call it colon- colonization, but it's it's probably more. I think it's it's exploration. It's not co- colonization. <laughs> yeah, and 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 at the end of this colonization, the number should be approximately 10 to the 34, 40, or even 50, which is, you know, a huge number. And therefore, we can consider it as to be kind of clout of uh, self-replicators. Would this be detectable if you've got that amount of them in, in this configuration? Would that be detectable as a techno signature from a distance, not within your star system? That's a different story. Okay. Okay, that's uh, that's very interesting because if they so let's uh, you know discuss a bit a bit uh, how they replicate right. What I've done in my paper, I just considered very very non-relativistic particles. Uh, non-relativistic mean uh, I mean with velocities less than the speed of light, and even in that case, with this very very you know um, say 0.01 speed of light velocity. Self-replicators will, during this uh, journey, they will collect uh, matter. And since we know that more than 99% of, of the universe is, is full of hydrogen, I made calculations uh, for hydrogen atoms. And I actually uh, would have found that uh, during this, you know, this uh, collecting matter for self-replicating, what actually happens? We catch hydrogen and they become, you know, they, 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 they accelerate actually. And since accelerating charges emit, these self-replicators, these clouds of self-replicators must emit. And according to calculations, they should emit in a broadband, starting from radio up to infrared and even X-ray emission spectrum. So in my last paper, what I've done, it is, uh, it is about how is it possible to catch them to observe by means of this 500 meter fast telescope, which is in China, you know, this is uh, a radio telescope. And actually, it turns out that this fast telescope, in fact, can observe this, uh, you know, techno signature of, of possible Vonneman probes, galactic and even extra galactic probes. It can catch, it can observe. Yes. Now, with the fast telescope, brand new, very impressive telescope. Now, what would, what frequencies really would it want to search at? I mean, is it arbitrary or, I mean, could you look at any, is there any sort of a marker frequency to look at in radio for this? Okay, yes. I just tried to use the frequency, which is, which is used in fast, right? So, as I told you, the emission the spectrum is, is, a, is a broad emission. It starts from radio up to, you know, infrared. What I've done in, in, in my case in case of fast telescope, in you know, a fast telescopes, uh, say operational frequencies from 70 megahertz to three gigahertz, right? And in this interval, I I've made my calculations, and it turned out that yes, it is quite possible that approximately let's uh, uh, let's make uh, let's take some you know some some average value, let's say several gigahertz. It is possible to you know, observe, of course, if they exist. Was it possible also for such a swarm to intentionally emit? In other words, could it function in and of itself as a SETI beacon and blast out at 1420 megahertz or something like that where we know to look? So could this also be a way of messaging? Oh, yeah, sure. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes, of course. On to another techno signature. The idea of the Dyson Sphere or Stapledon Sphere, as they sometimes call it, because Dyson really was more of a swarm. This would really just be a kind of Dyson swarm just on a very, very tiny scale. So it's more like a von Neumann Dyson swarm (laughs) moving into a star system. (laughs) In the sense of energy collection, what could something like this do in a star system? You mean how it works? Yeah, yeah. How does it... uh, in other words, how is it how is it powering itself from the the, the radiation of the star? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this uh, idea of uh, Freeman Dyson, who was published in in 1960, if I remember exactly, this paper really wasn't you know was a very 
interesting and outbursting idea because uh, he has assumed that if ETs exist, if they have enough energy, you know, if they have enough, you know, a level of technology. Oh yeah, one thing I'd like to emphasize that when I'm saying about the level of technology, I mean in the context of uh, Kardashev scale. Uh, Kardashev, uh, by the way, he has died some months ago. He was a um, pro- prominent astronomer, Russian astronomer, and he actually made some definition of uh, level of technology by means of the uh, energy uh, which is consumed by the uh, by the you know civilization in his say category he's uh, saying that level one civilization is a civilization which uses the total energy of uh, w- which is incident from the host star to the planet the second uh, the, the level two technology is the technology which uh, uses the whole energy of the host star and actually, I'm talking about this uh, particular level of technology. And, and also, level three technology is the one which uses the whole energy of the host galaxy. So, in this context, Freeman Dyson has assumed that if level two civilizations uh, exist, and if they can actually uh, use the total energy of the, of the host star, from the laws of physics, we know, we, we know that the only possibility is to envelop the star in a in a spherical shell. This, this is the only possibility. In that case, you know, this is only half part of the problem. You know? And the second half is very interesting. If the civilization is using such kind of a megastructure, megastructure because, because the length scale should be about one astronomical unit, it is huge. But on the other hand, if the civilization is, is living inside this internal surface of the sphere, uh, then the sphere will be warmed up and uh, it will be visible in the sky in the infrared spectrum. So that's very interesting. The huge omega structure, uh, let's say a huge object which is emitting in the infrared spectrum, almost total energy of the uh, of the you know t- typical star, let's say solar type star, right? So why this very say optimistic view? Because uh, in in typical stars w- when they say uh, when they are emitting their energy, let's say our sun, the length scale of uh, of the uh, star is uh, much much smaller than the length scale of a dice sphere. So in that case, infrared astronomy began very you know popular in in this context, and and by the way, some candidates have been found, but it was not a, a say a last verdict. We need more data, actually. So this is the idea of, uh, of Raymond Dyson, who has actually, I would, I would say, turned the idea of you know, standard SETI listening to the stars. <laughs> it's not standard listening to the stars. I think this, is, uh, th- this was a one new, 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 new trend in, in SETI research. Yeah. The candidates for the Dyson spheres, and I know of two separate papers that had candidates. One of them, I think there was like 16 candidates, something like that years ago. And then another, presumably looking at the IRS data, I assume. And the other being a TYC star that was looking kind of strange as though it might have been potentially a a partial Dyson swarm or Dyson sphere rather. Has any follow-up work been done since the release of those papers? Has anybody taken a second look to try to collect more data? As I know, we still are there. <laughs> we don't know, yes. So nothing interesting at this moment. We don't know. So we, we don't have uh, more data to, to be confident that these objects are really, uh, you know, really uh, Dyson spheres or something like that. Now, with the Dyson sphere, the expected techno signature, the argument has been made that they would be, not be feasible. In other words, you would just, they, they're, they're just too much. They would fly apart and there's no material that could handle the stresses of being such an object. What's your view on that? Okay, in case of material, that's actually uh, wrong because in typical, say, um, planetary systems, we have enough enough material to collect the Dyson sphere. But of course, you understand that, uh, you know, collecting such a huge mega structure, it needs a lot of time. And one has to think how to decrease this time scale <laughs> of constructing these uh, mega structures. So in this case, um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that I'm pessimistic about standard Dyson spheres, but because actually level two civilizations, in fact, they could construct this mega structure for a long time scale. 
during a long time scale. But of course, for smaller time scale, it is also possible what I've uh, what I I also have done in my in my papers. But concerning internal stresses, it is true. It is almost impossible to construct one monolithic sphere because of the internal gravitational you know stresses no material can maintain stability of the structure so the only possibility is to use some kind of you know some uh, belt like structures not spherical structures uh, monolithic spherical structures so on the one hand yes there is enough material in uh, in standard typical planetary systems but time scales are very very large on that hand, as Freeman Dyson has pointed out in his paper, we actually need about 3,000 years to reach level two civilization. Of course, we need, it is very, we, we just estimate, if we maintain 1% of technological increment, annual increment, then in 3,000 years we can reach level two civilization. And in that case, uh, cons- construction of, of Dyson sphere, total, say, not monolithic, he didn't know, in 1960, that monolithic uh, Dyson spheres are almost impossible. But but let's forget about that at this moment. To construct the, the you know this such a huge mega structure, it should need at least 1,000 years. At, at least I think, which in case of level two civilization is enough. I mean, it is quite possible, quite quite feasible. But anyway, I think any civilization has to try to decrease this time scale. Of constructing mega structures and and so on, and what I've said, what I've told you in recently, belt-like structures are quite possible, but not around uh, t- typical stars, but but around pulsars. So why not? <laughs> it is also possible. Now, in the case of a ring, and I guess you could call it a Niven ring, but I guess maybe that's applicable, maybe not. But in the case of a ring around a pulsar, now pulsars produce two relativistic jets that ring could take advantage of if it's collecting energy from the pulsar, right? Yeah. What distance would you need to be with your ring from the pulsar to avoid the magnetic fields and everything else that are very extreme in these environments? Okay. On the one hand, in case of pulsars, the length scale of this ring of of this little belt-like structures should be at least 10 times less. At, at least. This is one thing. On the other hand, what I made in my estimates, very crude estimates, by the way, because what many things we don't know still about, you know, what kind of life we are looking for, what kind of biology, uh, you know, sustainability, and, and many many problems are there. But anyway, let's let's talk about, you know, more or less the same biology as we are. Then it is quite possible to screen out this emission, very strong emission from uh, pulsars by means of standard, typical, concrete kind of material uh, used for constructing uh, ring-like structures. So it's not impossible. It is quite possible. I made these calculations in my paper, in, in my very first paper, which was published, I think, in 2016. So yeah, um, it is quite feasible. In spite of the radiation, x-rays, and, and, and all these things, by taking into account all these emission jets, and whatever, it is quite possible to, 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 to screen out. So screening it out, but would it also create a situation where there would be leakage from the pulsar, meaning that a very, very strange signature would be seen with a pulsar like this with a ring around it that's within our line of sight from leakage of this, uh, you know, the relativistic jets going past the ring. So that ostensibly should be a techno signature, right? Oh yeah, sure. The the thing is that you know, uh, most interesting thing is that if ring-like structures are used, and as I think in one of the recent papers of of Jason Wright, I think he has shown that monolithic spheres can't be stable, and I I think uh, ring-like structures should be used even in case of normal stars, say solar type stars. Then very interesting thing is that you know very interesting say techno signature. It appears uh, if we consider ring-like mega structures, because uh, what actually we need, we need to put this ring-like structure in an in an equilibrium state, right? In an equilibrium position. But nothing is in nothing is in equilibrium in the universe. If you just put in equilibrium, it will oscillate in this around this equilibrium state, and this oscillation, in a certain sense, is is inevitable from the from the laws of physics it comes comes out 
in that case, if the structures oscillate, and if we are looking at them, let's say, let's suppose that we found them, we are observing the subjects, this will, say, reveal very interesting techno signature. I mean, interesting in the sense that uh, if these uh, objects are oscillating, they are, they are approaching us, they are going from us, you know. Uh, in that case, by means of the Doppler effect, it will be um, visible as a, as a variable object. It's a length scale will be variable. And variable stars are quite well-known stars. But this, let's say, let's say stars, will be quite different from those standard variable stars. Because length scales of, uh, of or periods what, of these objects will be very different. In standard variable stars, length scales are, say, several months. But in case of rings, the length scale will be even even several minutes, starting from several minutes, depending on, on, on a particular object, I mean, particular mm, physical parameters of pulsars, up to several years. Which means that, in this case, we will observe some kind of anomalous variability. So my view is that we have to look for anomalous variable stars. Stars, let, uh, let's, let's call them stars. <laughs> yeah. Now, in the case of... A pulsar ring. Okay. To my knowledge, we're not looking at those for this sort of thing as a techno signature. Do you think it's possible that we're looking in the wrong place and that we really should be looking at pulsars? Oh yeah, sure, of course. At this moment, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't look at that. But in fact, it's quite technically possible. In my first paper, I've shown that at this moment we can monitor about about approximately sixty four pulsars to try to understand if uh, there are some objects like rings and to try to understand if they are if there are some can ca candidates yes we can and there are several possibilities as i told you okay starting from infrared astronomy we can uh, we can try to understand we can tr we can try to look for infrared rings but apart from infrared rings also hot rings are possible Hot in the sense that if uh, if the distance if the if the radius of the, of these rings are radius you know of these rings are smaller than uh, as I told you 0.01 astronomical unit or or even less the temperature of this mega structure might be much higher. Also, technically, it is possible to maintain the living system inside these rings. I have made corresponding calculations in my papers. So there there is no tech. I mean, I always say technical problem, but still we don't know what kind of biology uh, exists, yeah, right? But let's suppose that we are considering a similar biology as we are. In that case, hot Dyson, I would say hot Dyson rings will be visible in uh, also in visible spectrum. So starting from standard astronomy, visible spectrum astronomy, up to infrared astronomy, it's quite possible to widen the field of, of the search for extraterrestrials. Uh, around pulsars. Now, in a hot ring situation, could that even get hot enough to be in visible light? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, the, the major idea is that, the major idea is that if the rings are used, in case of pulsars, independently on their, on their length scale, the idea is to use the total energy emitted by the pulsar. And the pulsars are emitting energy sometimes even, even higher than sun is emitting, you know, right? So in that case, if we have optical, I would say, rings visible in the optical spectrum, the total energy will be emitted by these rings will be approximately the same of the same value. So they might be even higher than, uh, than our uh, host star sun is emitting. Is it possible for an alien civilization building such a ring around a pulsar, is there anything they can do to engineer the pulsar to be ideal for this that might be visible? In other words, keep it from glitching or doing something, you know, that's that's undesirable for them if they want stability to the thing. Can you engineer a pulsar? Is it within a Kardashev type two or three civilization's power to go that far and make a pulsar into the perfect pulsar for a ring? Engineer a pulsar, you mean to construct a pulsar? <laughs> <laughs> well, construct one or alter one. Do something that's that's very unnatural to such an object that we could detect. Oh, I don't know. This is uh, out of my knowledge. <laughs> I don't know, really. 
Yeah. It's a good idea, by the way. It's interesting to think about. Yeah. I'll, I'll think about that. <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting to think. And, I, and what I'm referencing back to is some people say that stellar lifting and things like that. Yeah. But I, that, I do wonder about that because sometimes we see things in the cosmos that don't make a whole lot of sense. For example, peculiar stars. There's one called Shavilsky star that. Oh, yeah. Sure. It, it, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It seems to contain transuranic elements in it that it shouldn't, you know. So th when you see those things, you're like, well, are there other examples? And then you don't see other examples and you're like, well, what, what, you know, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Quite possible. Yeah. And that's, that's, yeah. that's the one, the one way that I think that we'll, we'll eventually discover something is we'll see something that is unambiguously weird that it's like nature didn't do that, you know, and that that'll be the way that we find them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we seem to be getting closer with things like KS8462852, Tabby Star and things like that. Where oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Tabby Star. Our, our instrumentation is getting such where it, we could really find a techno signature at some point. Now, you mentioned earlier about the idea of using FAST oh, yeah. for extra galactic searches for artificial intelligence. What goes into that? Okay, actually, even even in case of Dyson spheres, if you try to find you know extraterrestrials, aliens from from other galaxies, why not? The only th the only thing is that uh, if we just just try to you know, search for extraterrestrials from other galaxies, but uh, but uh, around uh, around one star, let's say level two civilization, at this moment is almost impossible because we have no. And uh, we, we have no technology to, to try to, you know, fix them there. So the only possibility is to try to search for a level three civilization. So level three is a civilization which uses the total energy of the host galaxy, which means that if all stars of the galaxy are enveloped by Dyson spheres or Dyson sphere uh, structures or something like that, in that case, the total energy emitted by this enveloped galaxy will be the energy of the galaxy which is a huge number, of course. And this technology we have because we, we see galaxies, right? We observe them. And in case of galaxies developed by the isospheres in the sense, what I've told you, then these galaxies will be uh, visible in infrared, mostly, probably, but uh, having, you know, having the enormous luminosity of emission. And, and, and it is quite, quite, quite possible, actually. But as I know, you know there was a... There are several papers, by the way, and they have actually mo monitored, monitored several hundred, hundreds of thousands of, of galaxies, of, of nearby galaxies, which, uh, which of course is a, you know, is a tiny fraction of the total number of galaxies in the universe. But anyway, in the nearby galaxies, there are no, say, Dyson galaxy candidates. At this moment, we can say this for sure. But but still, you know, the number, the total number of galaxies are enormous. So so why not? Yes, we have to try to search for. Could the search be done if they filled their entire galaxy with ring-like structures? Would hot ring-like structures be detectable in this way as well? Well, look, what I'm talking talking about, you know, um, uh, dozen spheres or around solar type stars or, or or just stars i don't mean that they that these structures will be you know will be um monolithic uh, spherical structures as it turned out I, I told you it is almost impossible no material can maintain you know can can stay stable against uh, internal you know stresses gravitational stresses so so i mean actually in a combination of uh, of rings so uh, this is the same so uh, the spherical structure can be constructed by means of you know several rings around the star. Only rings can be used, or not only, but also oh, also. Uh, by the way, there was a paper last year, uh, two two years ago or last year, I don't remember exactly, uh, that swarms of probes uh, can mimic Dyson sphere. They they so there's a swarm around us around the star of uh, small say replicating. Probes, volumeal probes. So volumeal probes also can be used to construct some kind of, you know, some kind of not not standard kind of, you know, ring-like or Dyson-like spheres, but but they can envelop a star. The major problem is this, and why not? So yeah. So now back to the idea of very small 
von Neumann probes in this context. Okay. Now, th it just struck me that there would probably be another way to detect those because they essentially would also qualify as a sort of dust, which we can see that in red light versus blue light in dusty star systems. So you could have a confirmation that these things are actually there just by their size and how light is absorbed by them or not absorbed, right? Okay, the major problem is to how to distinguish if they are, you know, that that's a sphere, uh, sorry, uh, volume probes or, or dust particles. As I told you, if they are just, you know, just passive dust particles, we'll see them as standard dust particles with a, with a spectral feature of typical black body radiation, which is not in case of volume or probes. So they can be quite easily distinguishable, you know, from uh, dust particles. They, I mean, on, on the one hand, they are as if like, you know, like dust particles, but not not dust particles from the point of view of observation and te techno signatures, because in my last paper, I'll, I also discuss this particular problem because the, uh, yeah, the, the major part, no dust particle emits in, in the radio spectrum. So, uh, techno signature is completely different from typical astrophysical dust particles. Now, in one of your papers, you point out the weak Fermi paradox. Now, what is the difference between a strong Fermi paradox and a weak one? <laughs> yes, okay. In strong Fermi, par Fermi say, uh, par paradox, it's said that so we wouldn't see any kind of aliens, right? And so the problem is why. In my case, I discuss uh, only highly advanced level two or even level three civilization. And I actually prove that. that well, okay, proof. <laughs> I also use, I, I try to use this very, you know, ca carefully, these words. But I try to understand in my papers, in, in, my, in one of my, you know, paper about uh, Fermi, weak Fermi paradox. How is it possible to to solve uh, this paradox only concerning level two civilization. So not concerning all kinds of alien civilizations, but only level two or, or three civilization. In spite of that, probably if they exist aliens, probably they should be level two or level three. The, the, there is another reason why, but, but, but anyway, most of them should be of level two civilization. Anyway, since I just, you know, I consider only part of alien technological civilization. Uh, I, I cannot say that it is, you know, strong Fermi paradox. It's, it's a weak Fermi paradox. We, we don't see level two civilizations because uh, they, they are hidden, let's say, inside or behind var variable stars, uh, be behind anomalous variable stars. But only level two civilization and, and the level three alien uh, technologies I use, I um, discuss that in my paper. So this is a di this is a difference. What is your gut feeling as an astrophysicist about the commonality of these alien civilizations? Is it reasonable to expect that we could detect one or is it just a leap too far and that the solution to the Fermi paradox is that alien civilizations are just extraordinarily rare, which is why we don't see them. What's your sense of that? Oh, well, good question. And actually, actually quite difficult, difficult question. I mean, difficult to answer. <laughs> I think, I, I mean, in, in, in my view, standard SETI approach uh, in a certain sense has fallen. Because uh, only listening to, star, to, to the stars is not very efficient, say, way of uh, searching for extraterrestrials. And uh, I think we have to try our best. I mean, we have to check any kind of channel in the cosmos. So my answer is I don't know really, but uh, what, I sh what I know for sure is that if we don't try to check every single channel in the cosmos, then we have to be sure that we will never find that. <laughs> so that's my actually not very direct answer to your question. <laughs> so I assume what you the, the the meaning is that directed SETI searches, just looking at star for after star for twenty minutes and then moving the radio telescopes, does not have a high likelihood as opposed to a different approach. 
Sorry. So that it, it's the way we do it now. It's 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 not very likely with targeted study searches for us to to actually make a detection. Oh yeah. So sure. that we have yeah. to look at different approaches. Oh yeah 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah. Which some people are are, are suggesting Pano study and then there's other programs thinking you know all sky searches and things like that. But can you do such a thing? Well, actually, let me ask you this: with the pulsars and looking for rings, is there a data set that could be searched that we already have? to look for signatures of these, or do we need to do completely new observations of the pulsars tuned for this? Oh yeah, sure. We need more observations because because in case of pulsars, we of course, we from the last century when pulsars have been in a detected, for a first pulsar has been detected, several decades we are uh, actually studying pulsars, but not in, in, in this context, you know? And as you, as you understand, every context concretizes you know, the way of observation, since there were no idea how to, you know, no, no idea concerning alien civilizations close to pulsars, the corresponding observations, uh, which have been already done, were abs absolutely different. So we have to search for alien civilizations close to pulsars, you know, with particular kinds of observations we have to we have to arrange special observations because as i told you you know infrared observations trying to search for variability you know very variability also is in my case it's uh, it's a solution of the weak fermi paradox but uh, but in case of pulsars variability searches have have not been done yet so uh, because there was, there was no interest actually so i think some new kind of you know set of experiments have to be done in my view it is very essential it strikes me as a a very long term techno signature because you're if you're going to go through the trouble of building a ring around a pulsar you're probably going to want to maintain it very long term and that seems to me to be a a a very solid techno signature because it would last a long time do you think that would be the case that it's not some transient thing this this was probably something that if you see it, you're going to see it for a very, very long time, right? A long, long time of what? Well, say half a million years, you know. If you go through the trouble of building it, you probably want to keep it around <laughs> <laughs> and and use it long term and maintenance it. So that would make it a long term okay. techno signature as opposed to, yes. you know, some of the others. Yes, quite quite prob probably yes. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> still, you know. Well, we still have to look at it now. The other benefit of this is that there aren't that many identified pulsars in the galaxy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a small population that to search for a, a method like this. So long term in a small population is a good thing. Yes, exactly. So we know, I mean, the number of, of stars in the galaxy are much, you know, much higher, much bigger than the number of pulsars. And not only detected, but we know that uh, from standard ast astrophysics, we know that the number of pulsars must be less, much less than the number of stars. So on the one hand, it is difficult to uh, make these pulsars you know, our targets uh, f of searching uh, alien civilizations. But on the other hand, since they are very rare compared to stars, this is my point. Uh, this is my view that uh, that might be might be the say in a certain sense a way of how to solve Fermi paradox in in its weak sense, of course. So yeah, it is quite interesting. A lot of things has to be done. <laughs> it would be an interesting situation if the reality of the galaxy is that all of the civilizations conclude that it's better to live at a pulsar. So that's where all the advanced ones are, the type twos and type threes, and that. The reason we don't see them is that we just haven't looked at the pulsars and that all of a sudden everything could light up. I'm not even sure if if targeted SETI searches have ever even been done on pulsars. Are you aware of any research in that? You know, the, the, the major approach in this case is that if they exist, we live in, in the same universe. So laws of physics are the same for us. It doesn't matter in which terminology they, they say discovered physics or the laws of nature. Since we know, they they also ha uh, you know have to know, right? If they are advanced enough, and so we are looking for very advanced civilizations. In that case, technically, using pulsars is is much better than typical standard stars, solar type stars, or that or whatever. And since we know that, they must also know that. Uh, <laughs> so this my this my say major say approach that laws of physics are the same. 
from this view, it's quite underst quite understandable that yeah, why not? But uh, pulsars are not the only possibilities, you know, from these exotic objects. There are also some papers concerning black holes, using of, of black holes, uh, which are even very rare compared to even compared to uh, pulsars, right? To use for extracting energy. Yes. So uh, maybe you know maybe the solution of Fermi paradox is is in in in, in searching for aliens living or let's say operating nearby these very exotic objects maybe <laughs> <laughs> could you you may not be able to answer this question but it's it's the natural one that popped in my head <laughs> could you build a ring around a black hole to harness the power of that's coming out of the accretion disk of the black hole now that's some very science fiction territory there just imagining such a thing blows my mind but could you do it Okay, that's a, that's a very difficult question. I, I, now, okay, it depends. If if there are black holes, I mean, actually, black holes usually they might have accretion disks, and also there is a possibility that black holes have have already say eaten all this matter in, around them, so they are say nude, you know, nothing is around them. If I remember exactly, in that paper, in one of this last papers of. Um, I don't remember exactly now who was the author. They are considering black holes in a vacuum, so or more more or less vacuum. No matter is uh, is around them. But on on the other hand, on the other hand, it is, I think, but I'm not sure. I think uh, that it is uh, it is not impossible to say clean up the nearby region of of black holes and then construct a, something, you know, some some structure around around black holes. But anyway, I don't know this particular part. But still, scientists are considering this very exotic objects on, as well. It's interesting because it, it, it's, it's, it, how does one read the mind of an alien, <laughs> yeah. you know, civilization? But exactly. when you think about the, <laughs> the utility of, of certain things, but just the idea of extreme environments like black holes and near neutron or uh, uh, pulsars is, is mind blowing to think about because it's the mo it could be. It is plausible that the most extreme environments in the universe are where everybody congregates. Oh, yeah, sure, exactly, yes, yes. And uh, the major problem is that we don't know what kind of life we're looking for. Biology, the, there's the major, you know, say, concern and problem. And in any kind of, say, possible experiment, SETI experiment, we have to uh, take into account also this particular part, biology. We have no no idea. We have no data. The only the only data we have, it's us, <laughs> but it's not enough, you know. <laughs> Do you think, at some point in the far future, the human species, should we survive, would we build a megastructure like this? I mean, is that something that we might do? Build a ring around the sun? Okay, as I told you, yeah, as I told you, okay, at this moment we are say we're not even level one civilization by the way level one civilization is a technological civilization which uses the total energy incident from the host star on the planet so we are at this moment we are 0 0.75 not even one okay we need about 1000 years in one of my papers i think in the last paper i've made this calculation that we need i think uh, one or two thousand years okay so something like that let's say 1,000 years, approximately, you know, the time scale, to reach level one civilization. But uh, again, if we assume that we maintain during this time scale, during this period, 1% of annual increment of, uh, you know, te technological increment, right? Uh, at this moment, we have 1% uh, approximately, by the way. 1% uh, increment from the last century up to now, we have approximately 1% per annual. So it is quite realistic, actually. Again, I don't know how quite realistic for 1,000 years, <laughs> but it's quite re realistic if we assume that we maintain this increment. In 1,000 years, we can reach level level one civilization, and then you know, in in total, we need 3,000 years to reach level two civilization. So yeah, why not? Uh, in that case, we will be able to construct mega structures around our star at least our star, then maybe uh, to find some nearest pulsar and construct a ring. Because in general, 
what in general assume in this field is we assume that a level of a level of technology and the amount of energy which we consume are proportional <laughs> we don't know still you know maybe it's not true but what is say uh, time scale of our technology uh, we we are technological civilization with time scale about approximately i don't know 100 years something like that or or maybe 150 yeah but i always say 100 because uh, first radio signal uh, sent from the earth was say uh, in in 1914 something like that okay so let's let's say that we are our time scale of te- of uh, technological civilization is just 100 e- 100 years right right so still we have no statistics <laughs> we have we don't know can we survive one or two or th- or especially 3000 years to reach a level to civilization but science cannot operate this kind of you know questions let's suppose we we survive and then then let's see <laughs> what what potentially we can do and potentially we can do that if we survive if we maintain 1% of increment then okay it is quite possible but at some point we can we can construct a huge mega structure but but by the way it is also possible that we can construct uh, say at at the initial stage we can con- construct something like reaching level 1 civilization we can construct a mega structure around, around the earth not uh, not the you know uh, not the sun so a, basically an orbital ring around this planet essentially yeah 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 but not ring, let's say, in a uh, spherical-like, not monolith- monolithic, but spherical-like structure composed of uh, probes, whatever. It doesn't matter. Rings, probes. Well, we've already started on that <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> with the amount of satellites we're launching, and that's uh, certainly accelerating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, Doctor, we are out of time. Thank you for joining us today. And next time you release a paper, I hope you'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.